we have defined the ips now we need to construct the portfolio at a high level portfolio construction involves a strategic asset allocation which says how we allocate our funds across different asset classes then we might do a tactical asset allocation and finally we need to do some security selection we are going to focus on strategic asset allocation and then talk a little bit about tactical asset allocation the investment objectives and constraints that we have talked about so far are all investor specific before we can do a strategic asset allocation we also need to have a view on capital markets we therefore need to define the long term capital market expectations this involves defining our expectations related to the stock market the bond market and markets for other asset classes in which we might invest we combine information about the investor with information related to the markets run through a optimization or simulation exercise and then come up with the strategic asset allocation the work that happens here is largely done through computer systems but we have learnt material in the last two readings which is applied given the capital market expectations there will be a certain efficient portfolio there will be a certain risk free rate we will come up with a capital allocation line based on our expectations of the market the ips essentially defines the indifference curves for a investor we combine this to define the optimal allocation across different asset classes and that optimal allocation is called the strategic asset allocation or the saa for simplicity let's assume that we have defined a asset allocation that is 60% stocks and 40% bonds with time the asset allocation will drift from the target allocation this is our target allocation let's say in a given period stocks do extremely well and we end up with 90% in stocks and 10% in bonds the ips needs to define the amount of drift that is allowed here the drift has been substantial the amount of drift that is allowed should be defined in the ips and the ips should also define a rebalancing policy for example if there is a drift do we come back into this for example if there is a drift do we come back exactly to this strategic asset allocation or do we come back within a certain range that is a rebalancing policy which has to be explicitly stated this information is often found in the appendix just as a general point i have talked about this at a very high level over here this material is covered in immense detail at level 3 so if you feel that you are not getting enough detail right now just pass level 1 and level 2 and then you will see this in a lot of detail at level 3 specifying asset classes when defining the strategic asset allocation it is important to consider the asset class correlation matrix what we are looking at here is a very simple correlation matrix these are some classic asset classes the correlation between equities and equities obviously is one the correlation between fixed income and equities is minus 0.35 this refers to hedge funds and then real estate private equity commodities and currencies we have talked about asset classes several times but i have not given you a definition here is a very simple one when we talk about a asset class we are referring to a category of assets with similar characteristics similar attributes similar risk and return and so on at a high level we could say that equities is one asset class but then within equities we can have several sub asset classes 
for example large cap medium cap small cap you could also have subclasses that distinguish between different regions and so on here are a couple of questions which are important from a exam perspective given the matrix on the left which asset class is most sharply distinguished from equities and i'm deliberately using this phrase because i have seen it several times in the curriculum most sharply distinguished simply means which other asset class has the lowest correlation with equities if you take a look at equities then the asset class with the lowest correlation with equities is fixed income so that is the correct answer another important point that is illustrated through this question what is lower the pairwise correlations between asset classes or pairwise correlations between assets in the same asset class clearly this is going to be lower asset classes by definition have different attributes and characteristics so the correlations between asset classes should be low relative to the correlation of assets within an asset class different stocks would fall within the equities asset class and generally the correlation between stocks is going to be relatively high again compared to the correlation across asset classes and that is why it makes a lot of sense to define your strategic asset allocation where we are defining the relative weightage of different asset classes such as stocks bonds commodities and so on steps toward an actual portfolio we've talked about strategic asset allocation after strategic asset allocation there is the concept of a tactical asset allocation let's say our strategic asset allocation is 60% stocks 40% bonds but in the next 6 months we expect bonds to do relatively well and we expect stocks to either stay flat or go down perhaps because we believe that the stock market currently is overvalued it is possible that we temporarily change our asset allocation because we are somewhat bearish on stocks we might change the allocation and say that we now want 50% in stocks and 50% in bonds we have underweighted stocks relative to the strategic asset allocation we are only doing this for the short term because we have a short term bearish view in the long term we expect to come back to this strategic allocation when we do something like this make a short term change to the allocation that is called a tactical asset allocation the specific selection of stocks and bonds is called security selection but that is not emphasized in this reading the most important step over here is strategic asset allocation so let's get a little deeper into this step the strategic asset allocation is a means of providing the investor with exposure to the systematic risks of asset classes in proportions that meet the risk and return objectives as we have seen in previous readings we only get a return or we are only rewarded for taking systematic risk when we talk about strategic asset allocation and we say 60% in stocks what we are really talking about is investing in the market if we are a us investor and we say 60% stocks then we would be talking about investing in say a uh, index fund based on the S&P 500 when we do this we are taking market risk or systematic risk there is no non systematic risk and we are therefore rewarded for the entire risk that we take similarly the 40% in bonds would be based on some bond index such that we are only taking systematic risk based on several academic studies we know that a significant percentage of overall returns can be explained based on the strategic asset allocation what that means is that to a large extent the return that we get is based on this allocation the strategic asset allocation as opposed to security selection or temporarily changing our 
asset allocation. Here is another concept that is introduced in this reading but then discussed in a lot more detail at level 3 and that is the concept of risk budgeting. Risk budgeting is the process of deciding on the amount of risk to assume in a portfolio. That's called the overall risk budget. And then how that risk is distributed across the different sources of investment return. At a high level, we get investment return based on our strategic asset allocation and then based on our tactical allocation and then based on security selection. How we spread the risk or divide the risk across these different sources of return is part of risk budgeting. Again, I recognize that the statements I've made are very high level and that is all you really need to know at this level. Pass level 1 and 2 and you will see this in a lot more detail at level 3. Some terms that are important and should be known even at level 1. Passive investing versus active investing. When you simply invest in the market by say investing in a fund that is based on the S&P 500 index, that is called passive investing. You are not trying to figure out which stock is overvalued, which stock is undervalued. You are simply investing in the market. This sort of investing is called passive investing. Active investing means that you are actively looking for stocks that are undervalued and that clearly involves more work, more research, and that is called active investing. There is a investment strategy or a investment approach called the core satellite approach. What that means is you divide your portfolio into two parts, the core part and a satellite part. And this core part is managed based on a passive strategy where you put most of this money in some sort of a index fund so you are taking only systematic risk and then a part of the portfolio or the satellite is invested in stocks that you believe are undervalued that part is called active investing a combination of these two is referred to as a core satellite approach to investing a quick summary now of what we've been talking about. You need to understand risk objectives. These are defined either quantitatively or qualitatively. Qualitatively, we can say that the risk tolerance is either high, medium or low. We need to recognize that both the willingness and the ability to take risk should be considered. The ability to take risk is based on objective factors such as income, wealth, and so on. The willingness to take risk depends on psychological factors, situation, circumstances, and so on. The combination of the two help us define the overall risk objective for our client. Risk objectives can also be quantitative, and then within quantitative, we can either have relative risk objectives or absolute risk objectives. A risk objective that says that we do not want our return or we do not want losses of more than 5% would be an absolute risk objective. A relative risk objective refers to looking at the difference between the returns of our portfolio and the returns of a benchmark index. Return objectives, again, could either be relative or absolute. If we say that we need a return of 10% or more, that's a absolute return. If we talk about returns in terms of a benchmark by saying that our return needs to match the return of the S&P 500, that would be a relative return. From an exam perspective, you need to be able to calculate the return requirement based on the information given. There are several questions at the end of this reading which will test you on this. Constraints, you need to understand that there are five constraints and you need to also be able to just reel out these constraints. And here is something that can help you remember the constraints. It's something that helps me. Just remember LLTTU, liquidity, legal, time, tax, unique circumstances. And we've talked briefly about each of these. 
you just need to know a couple of lines about every item. Liquidity refers to the need to pull some money out of the portfolio. Legal refers to the legal and regulatory environment and how that impacts the sort of investments that can be made and the sorts of investments that cannot be made. Time horizon is long term or short term. A long term horizon would mean that we are investing for the long term. Short term horizon would mean that we are investing for a relatively short term. Tax considerations need to be taken into account when we create a portfolio and everything that is not covered here needs to be defined under unique circumstances. Combining all these items helps us come up with what's called the IPS. In addition to these items, there are several other pieces of information that also need to go into the IPS. We've talked about them and that material is important because there are several questions related to the structure and content of the IPS at the end of this reading. We then went on to talk about the construction of a portfolio. We combine information from the IPS, which is investor specific, with capital market expectations to come up with an appropriate strategic asset allocation. At times, we might deviate from the strategic asset allocation based on our short-term view of the capital market. That deviation is called tactical asset allocation. And finally, we need to do security selection. As always, I want you to read the summary, review the learning objectives, and make sure you can say something sensible about every learning objective. I have explicitly referenced examples 1 through 10 in this reading. Make sure you read those. Practice problems are good. Do all of them and then also do the practice questions from other sources. That is it.